Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Welcome back to the show. We are so excited to have Carla McGowan joining us here once again live on the Zoomcast and the podcast. She is the CEO and founder of Radiant Coaching and Counseling based out of Plano, Texas. Welcome. How are you? I'm doing great, Jill. How about you? I'm doing fantastic. And again, want to say Happy New Year to you. We haven't spoken since the New Year, right? No, um, no, we haven't. Happy New so, Year. Happy official New Year. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> so for those new time listeners, would you mind just telling us a little bit about the process of what you do as a coach and the types of people out there that may uh, be, you know, peaked, their interest may be peaked today from listening to us? Yes, yes. Well, um, I'm a life and relationship coach um, and also a pastoral counselor, mm-hmm. uh, faith-based counselor, and I work a lot with couples. I have a real passion and heart to see couples make it, especially in marriage. So I work with married couples, um, engaged couples, dating couples, and couples in crisis. And so um, today I really want to highlight my work with marriage because I think it's a new year, right? And I want people to have a fresh start. And I want people out there to know that if you are struggling in your relationship, that there is hope I just think that a lot of times people don't have the tools. Maybe they didn't see a good model in their home growing up. And so they have issues. So I, I have 15 things, problems. I don't think we'll get through all those, but I want to kind of highlight the ones that seem to come up the most. And so that's where we'll start. But I just, I've been doing this for 10 years and um, I really, really want to encourage people that if both of you in your relationship are willing to do the work, if you're teachable, And if you're willing to let go of resentments and you're willing to learn some new things and some skills and use some tools, I always say, I can't fix anybody's marriage, but I can give you the tools. I can teach them to you. I can help you use them. If you will do it, I can guarantee your relationship will improve. I love hearing this. Well, this is amazing. So thank you for being here, for joining us. And again, uh, we're going to go over uh, some of these areas, right, of some uh, issues in you find in marriage, in a sense. And we'll get through this list today. And um, I'm excited because, uh, you know, you're here to help. It is a new year, a new start, a new beginning. And I really believe in that. And um, I'm hoping this will help a lot of people and couples out there. Um, Tell us how we could contact you before we start. Sure. My website is www.radiantcoachingandcounseling.com. And also, um, I do offer a free consultation by phone. So I'm going to give you my phone number. It's 469-556-3884. Again, 469-556-3884. I do not mind you calling me or texting me. And you can check out my website and reach me there as well through email. So, uh, So let's just join. Let's just jump in. And so Initially, when I meet with a couple for the first time, I will say to them, I'll ask them, or even just weekly, if I see them, what is your best hope from our talking today? And it's a little strange question. Sometimes people look funny at me and I'm like, well, because I want to know what is your hope? What, what are you hoping to accomplish? Why are you here? Yeah. And then the next thing I want to know is what is your main issue? So literally nine times out of 10, it's communication. And I find that people are not communicating well, or they're not communicating at all, or they're fighting or arguing. And so when I did that research recently about the kind of the top reasons for divorce, number one was 73% was um, lack of commitment, but the 56% after that was arguing all the time. So when couples have a lot of strife and a lot of conflict and they don't know how to resolve it, they don't know how to get over it. It can cause so the atmosphere of the home, right? If you if you want to be able to come home and relax and feel this is this is my home and I feel safe here. But if you don't feel that way, feel like it's a war zone, you know, you, you really want to be able to work through the issues. So communication. So I teach rules of engagement. I have eight of them, and I have done this in detail in a in a former podcast, but I want to just kind of go through them quickly. Um, so the first one yep. is that you're always on the same team. Okay. That is a fundamental thing. You have to be on the same team. That means you're not on competing teams. It's not a competition. And the underlying premise or belief that you want to have is that we always have each other's best interests at heart. We're always mm-hmm. for each other, right? If I, if one person says to me, you know, I don't really know that my spouse yeah. has my best interests at heart, we're in trouble because if you don't believe that, then you really can't trust them fully. And if you can't trust them, the degree that you trust someone is the degree you can be intimate with them. So 
if you have a block or you have a wall, it's like okay. you can't get out and they can't get in. So you have to know and be able to feel safe in your communication. You have to be able, and because if you know you're on the same team and you know the other person has your best interest at heart and vice versa, you know, you're, you're, you're able to communicate and you can trust each other. So the next one is one play. So one play meaning one issue at a time. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So you don't want to talk, start talking about something and then uh, bring in three other things, right? That's so hard for someone like me, who's all over the map, like ADHD and just goes uh, on tangents. Okay. One thing okay. at a time we well, can, we'll get, we'll address everything. Yes. One, just stay on point. <laughs> right. But I think the reason that happens is that people get triggered. If there's stuff in the past that has not been resolved, or maybe it's a repeat, or it's like you did this before, or, you know, they start bringing in things from the past and it, it just can get a little confusing. It's like, okay, well, let's just stay on this issue and then we can move to the next. Okay. The next one is stay in the game. Stay in the game means do not shut down. You always want to be emotionally present. It's it's like if you are upset or angry, there is a time to, to step away. And we'll talk about that. But if you're not, you really want to be emotionally present with your partner. You want to be always turning toward them. You know, you always want to have connection and you don't want to just check out. I think some people don't know what to do sometimes. So they just literally just shut down. So you really want to avoid doing that. Okay. The next one is the initials L-U-V, love which stands for listen, understand, validate. And I believe this can be a game changer. So you really want to be able to listen well. I think sometimes people don't listen very well. They, they're they listening, but they're thinking about what they're going to say next. You really just want to listen, full attention, put your phone down, look at the person in their, in their eyes and listen to them, okay? And then use something called mirroring, which is repeating back what you heard them say. What I heard this... Let me just get this straight. This is what I heard you say. And then you repeat it back and you can say, did I get it right? And they can say, yes, that's what I meant. Or no, you missed it. That is not what I meant. Then you can ask clarifying questions or you can just say, okay, say it again. Mirroring is powerful okay. because if you are having a lot of misunderstandings, it could be a lot of negative assumptions. Like you meant that this way, or you're reading stuff into it. And it's like, if you're just repeating back and the other person says, yes, that's correct. There's no misunderstanding. There's no misunderstanding. You, you know that you both heard what was said. Mm -hmm. So it's a really great tool. It's great with children. It's good in business. It's good with anything, you know, to make sure you've understood the other person. And so that's the next step is understanding. So you want to seek first to understand before being understood. And I think the reason some people are such great communicators is because they really have their other focused and they have the ability to put themselves in the other person's shoes. It's like, help me understand where you're coming from. Why do you feel the way you do? Why do you have this opinion? What influenced you to have this opinion? Yeah. I really want to understand how your mind works. I want to be able to say, I get you. Okay. That's the thinking part of it. And then there's the feeling part, which is empathy. So empathy is not sympathy. Empathy is the ability to feel what another person is feeling. Mm -hmm. People have that off the chart. I mean, they are really sensitive. They can pick up people's feelings, but you can develop this. You can look at somebody's, you know, body language. You can listen to the tone of their voice. You can really, really tune in to how is this person feeling? Because you want to be able to say, I get you and I feel you. I, I, I understand, understand you. you. Yes, yes. <laughs> I understand you. Good. And then the validation. The validation yes. is really, really important. And I think people think they have to agree to validate and you don't. It's two different things. Um, agreement, you know, you may not agree, but if you validate, you're validating them as a person, because if you love them, you know, you care about how they think and feel it's important to you. And it shows a lot of respect. It's like, I can see how you could feel that way. I see what you're saying. I, I understand your point of view. I, even if I don't totally agree with you, I'm validating you because your feelings are valid. You get to have your feelings. You get to have your thoughts, right? So, um, this is very, very important because sometimes people are like, well, that's just stupid, right? They just discount the idea and it feels like you're discounting the person. So listen, understand, validate is, is incredibly powerful and can be a game changer. Um, the next one is timeout. Timeout is also incredibly important because I always tell people, listen, you cannot continue to talk to each other when you're angry. Mm -mm. I think people think they can. And they mm -hmm. want to do it right then. And it's like, yeah, you're, you're like, okay. angry, it's going it, to, anger is very volatile. It's very powerful. And if you're really angry and you just keep talking, 
the anger can take over. So now you're saying stuff you don't really mean, stuff you regret saying. You might have to go back later and say you're sorry. The other person can forgive you, but they won't forget what you said. You can't take the words back. Mm -hmm. So you really want to pay attention to yourself. It's called anger management, right? It's called self-discipline, self-awareness. If you know you're getting too upset. So I've taken some anger management classes just for Uh my information. And they use a scale of one to five, at least the ones I took. Well, I like a scale of one to 10. So your anger scale. Right. Mm-hmm. So if you're a one or two on that scale, you're a little aggravated, you're edgy, you're, you know, you're irritated, maybe you're tired. But if it starts to escalate and you can tell, wait a second, I'm getting up to about a five or six now. And I know I could go to 10. I mean, some people go from zero to 10 and nothing flat. They just lose their temper. Lose. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you really have to be able to say, OK, I'm taking a time out. So there's three things that have to happen. You have okay. to communicate it. You can't just walk away. You can't blow the person off. You have to say, look, I'm too upset. I'm taking a timeout because the whole, the whole purpose of the timeout is to go calm down. That's all it is. Uh, the other person has to give you permission, mm-hmm. right? Because sometimes people are like, no, you're not walking away from me. We're doing this right now. I'm like, please understand that if I keep talking to you right now, I'm going to start saying stuff that's really going to be hurtful. And I do not want to do that. I am going to go calm myself down. And then the third aspect is that you have to put a time limit to it. It is not open-ended. It's mm-hmm. like me 15 give me a half an hour, give me an hour. I'm going to go calm myself down and I'll see you back when we're both ready to talk about this again. So I always ask people, what do you do to calm yourself down? Yeah. And sometimes people don't have anything. They're like, I don't know. (laughs) How do I calm myself down? Ah. So I can, you know, breathing is a really good thing. Taking, doing breathing exercises, um, you know, because you have to release anger, you don't want to hold that stuff in doing something physical, do some kind of exercise, take a walk, take a run, go to the gym. Sometimes people say, I listen to music. I play video games. One of the best things I say is write a letter because when you sit down and write it, you let it all out, you release it. And then you can process and you can go back and go. Now, if I was really going to give this letter to this person, I would probably edit this. I would probably Ah. say this, but now you've processed it and you have your bullet points. And you're ready to have the conversation because you have calmed yourself down and you're ready to come back. So timeout is incredibly important. It Mm -hmm. saves a lot of hurt. You can do more damage talking to each other in 10 minutes when you're Uh. angry, right? You just don't want to do that. So the next one is no personal fouls. And you would only do personal fouls if you're angry. Um, Those are hitting below the belt, right? It's like, Screaming and yelling, cursing, you nobody wants to be cussed out. Um, name calling, if you're calling each other names, personal foul. Saying stuff like you always, you never, nobody always or never is anything. Don't do that. Uh, third party testimonials, bringing somebody else into the conversation or disrespectful body language. Mm-hmm. So disrespectful speech, disrespectful body language, no personal fouls. You will not do those if you take a time out. Okay. And then the last one, uh, not that last one, second to the last one is score a win-win. So you're always looking for the win for both of you. If one of you wins and one of you loses, you both lose. So you're always wanting to walk away from the conversation, feeling like you were heard, you were listened to, you got a win, maybe you compromised, you got a win for both people, okay? And then the last one is to celebrate. Just when you get a victory, celebrate it. When you use these tools, you know, I say people, I ask them, you know, after I give these tools, I'll say to each person individually, Don't think about the other person. Just think about yourself. What do you personally need to work on and put them somewhere where you can think about them so that you are, it's, you know, it's, it's a new habit. How do you create a new habit through repetition? You have to start making a different choice. So this is also another thing about communication is there was a a study done back in the sixties. It's pretty well-known study. Um, they, They call it the 738 55 rule. But they broke down communication into percentages. And they said that only 7% of our communication is actually the words that we say, which honestly, I think is low. Yeah, only 7%. I mean, I believe in the, yeah. Uh, Okay, but yeah, that is a little low, I would think. It is because words are so powerful. And I mean, you want to be so careful and you want to, you know, be impeccable with your words and always try to be positive and speaking life and encouragement, Mm -hmm. not tearing down, right? Not criticizing, not, you know, being mean. Um, So 7% though, it's only 7%. So 38% is our tone. It's the way we say what we say. So, you know, it has to do with the, the, the timbre of your voice, 
you know, uh, the speed that you talk. It also has to do with the motivation for what you're saying. So you can say the exact same words sweetly or sarcastically. They mean different things. Your tone is incredibly important. So you want to watch your tone. And then 55% is body language. So your body is talking really loud, 55%, right? So you want to be congruent with all of those areas. And I just, just a little aside, if you want to create rapport with someone, model and mirror their body language. So um, just a story about that real quick. I had a client come into my office one time and I was pretty high energy. I was talking pretty fast and he kind of came in and he sat back and crossed his legs. He started talking really slow like this. And I thought, Ooh, I'm in a different energy. So I said, okay. So I leaned back in my chair and I crossed my legs Mm -hmm. and I started talking really slow to match him. And it's almost a subconscious thing. Sometimes people don't even know, but what you're doing is helping them feel comfortable. You can even match people's breathing. It creates a rapport when you match their, their body language. Um, so that is a little bit about communication. Those are some of the tools. And the next one I want to talk about is it's interesting. I went to Christmas, um, brunch and I was sitting at the table with my nephew and his wife. And I said, so if I was going to, you know, talk about issues in marriage, cause they're married, um, what would be something that you would come to mind? And the, the what they said was the involvement of in-laws and extended family. And I thought, okay, this is interesting. Mm-hmm. So right at the holidays, I'm sure we got a lot of these stories, but <laughs> yes. So it's important to be on the same page with this because um, I think that I have run into this in the past where if um, the adult child has not really completely separated from the parents or the parents haven't let go of the adult child and they are too involved in the marriage or the adult child is trying to please the parents and it, you know, maybe the spouse not is not as important, but important. So the thing is this you, priority, right. Of your marriage. It's like, if you're a faith-based person, you know, if you believe in God, then God is first, then it's your spouse, then it's your children, then it's the rest of your family. And so there's even a scripture it's in Genesis two 24. It said, uh, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one. So there is kind of a leaving of your family of origin and cleaving and creating a new family and becoming one. And that is your priority. And if that's not straight, you know, it, it can, if somebody seems to be, you know, still trying to meddle or be too involved you know, you have to, you have to put those boundaries up and say, like, you know, I'm married now and my spouse is my priority. And so we make our decisions together. Mm-hmm. Um, so it doesn't cause friction in the marriage. Um, also just deciding where do we spend our, our holidays? You know, are we going to spend, you know, Thanksgiving at one family and the, at the other, you know, being on the same page with that is, is really important. Um, so the next one is co-parenting. And this is also incredibly important. So you really want to be on the same page as parents. This means that you come to an agreement about how you want to raise your children. How, what are the rules of the house? What are the boundaries? How do you discipline them? Mm -hmm. Um, And this is extremely important in blended families. So I work with a lot of blended families and it's always a little bit tricky when there's a step parent. And if the biological parent is not showing the children the step parent is your parent and we are a united front, right? It's not like this is an outsider that just happens to be in our house now. No, we are, we are married and we are a team and we're co-parenting together and you will respect them the way you respect me because you can get into a lot of trouble. If, if the biological parent is maybe favoring a child too much or not letting the step parent be involved in the decisions, it can cause a lot of friction in the marriage. And again, it can make the the, the step parent feel like they're not a priority. So you always want to make sure that your spouse is your priority. Wow. Okay. Because okay. your children are going to grow up and leave. They are going to get their own lives, but your marriage is there for the rest of your life, hopefully. So it needs to be the priority. Dr. Carla so- McGowan giving us all these uh Bullet points. Wow. Very important today. Very important. Just want to remind everyone how we can reach out to you uh, if we're interested at Radiant Coaching and Counseling. Is that the website? That's it. Radiantcoachingandcounseling.com. All right. Continue. Just had to interject. Of course. Yeah. Well, the next one would be money. 
Um, money is also incredibly important. We all have our own money story. Uh, our relationship to money is usually what we learn from our parents. Uh, some people are spenders, some people are savers, but you always want to have the sense of being financially married. And I think sometimes people don't get financially married. They still think this is my job and my money, and that's your job and your money instead of it's our money. And how are you going to set that up? So when I work with engaged couples, you know, professional people, I had a couple, you know, they're trying to figure out, well, do we keep our joint accounts? I mean, our separate accounts and just divvy up the bills or do we have a, a joint account or do we have both? Yep. And if we have a joint account. How do we fund it? And who's going to pay for what? And, you know, you have to figure that out. There's no fast rule on that. It's really what you feel comfortable with. I worked with another couple that was engaged one time and she was having such a hard time because she didn't want to give up having her own bank account. And he thought that she didn't trust him. And so it was causing friction. It's like, you can still have your own bank account, but you know, you, you are, if you are joining together, then you are financially, you know, a couple and you want to make your financial decisions together. Now, this is also very important when one person is working and the other person isn't, because we all know the golden rule, do unto others as you have them do unto you. But there's that other rule he who has the gold makes the rules. <laughs> so you want to make sure that the person that is maybe the breadwinner is not thinking, well, I'm in control because I make the money. It's our money. So you have to be on the same page with that and, and know how you're going to handle your money. How much do you want to save? So if somebody's a real spender and the other person's a real saver, it can be a problem. So you have to either make a budget or it just come together and talk it through. Be sure you're on the same page because money, I used to, I always thought that money was the number one reason people got divorced. I don't think it's as high, but I do think it, it can be a real issue. Um, so the next one is sex and, um, um, you know, sex is so important. I mean, it's, you've got to stay connected. You want to be best friends and lovers and I think I shared this last week a little bit, you know, the way to a woman's sexuality is through her heart, right? Yeah. The way to a man's heart is through his sexuality. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Yes. So women need to have their needs met, which is unconditional love. They need to feel safe and secure. They need open, honest communication. They need non-sexual touch and affection. They need all of those things emotionally. We're so emotionally driven. You know, men are a little bit more visually, they, they, they can just go, right? But, and they'll be more open and more vulnerable after, right? Because they're, they're more open that way. So you have to make sure that you keep your intimate life, you know, active. And I do talk to couples where they, they have trouble with that because the other things have gotten in the way. They're super busy. Um, it's just in general, you know, the lack of making your marriage a priority, but you have to plan it and you have to make time for it. So the average American couple has sex one to two times a week. The average French couple has sex three to four times a week. So I don't know if it's just sexier in France. I don't know, but yeah, I think they drink more alcohol. Maybe it lowers inhibitions. <laughs> don't they drink wine every day with their meal or is that oh, Italy? Yes. I don't know. I'm just thinking yeah. inhibitions lessons. Oh, yeah. uh, guilty. Well, they <laughs> I, they may have more leisure. You know, I lived in Europe for six years and I did notice it's probably different. It was a while ago, but they know how to stop. Like, you know, the stores would close at 2 p.m. on Saturday and they wouldn't open till Monday morning. I mean, I saw whole families taking walks on Sunday. It's like it wasn't 24 seven. Now, I, again, it could be different now, but they just have a, maybe a different rhythm of knowing when to stop. Yeah having more leisure time. But anyway, it's an interesting statistic. But I think if you know, you know, at least once or twice a week, we need to be coming together and, you know, more if, if necessary. Um, but you don't want to let that part of your life go away. And you can't get too tired. People say to me, I'm so tired. I can't. I said, well, find a way to not be so tired. You know, right. plan it, go on a date, make sure that you guys are making time for each other alone. You know, if you can get away once a quarter, just the two of you, even if it's just for one night, Yeah, get out of Dodge, do something different. I remember to date, you know, people fall in love by talking, right? We talk, we date, we go out, we have fun. We have experiences, we bond, get to know each other and we pursue. And we work so hard at that when we first fall in love and when we're dating, but what can happen is I'm kind of getting into the next one. When you, the, you're losing your connection because you're not making time and you're not, you're, it's not your priority. Uh, people stop talking. They stop dating and they stop pursuing 
and they wonder why their marriage isn't good. So you have to make it a priority. You have to have your own time to be together and you have to have time to be intimate and close with each other. Um, okay, so losing connection through neglect, distraction, personal goals, selfishness. So, you know, you really, I think I think I shared this before. There's something called gray divorce or silver divorce. It's kind of a phenomenon of empty, empty nesters where, you know, 18 years goes by and the kids leave and the, and the husband and wife are looking at each other going, well, I don't really know you anymore. We haven't really spent mm-hmm. much time together. We've grown apart. Yep. And then they decide to go their separate ways. Yep. Right. Or maybe the marriage wasn't good and they just hang in there till the kids leave. So it's, it's like, you have to really marriage takes work. And I think sometimes people think that just because they fell in love and had these intense, amazing emotions that that's just going to automatically stay. But it was because they took the time, they made it the priority. Communicate, communicate, co-parent. Yeah, I I got prioritized. Yeah, all the steps that we talked about before. Yes. And then I want to still talk, but we we don't have time for today, but we still have a few more to get through. My goodness. Oh, yes. So lack um, of spiritual connection, holding resentment, offenses, yes, grudges. Yes. Can we dive into that? Infidelity, yes. even the next time? Because this, this, this is going to yes. be big. Is yeah, that yeah. okay? Sure. Um, holding on resentments. I think that people have to be able to be teachable and be um, show grace, be willing to apologize. There's a way to make an apology. I'm sorry for X, Y, Z. Yeah. I was wrong. Um, I'm sorry. I hurt you. Will you please forgive me? Um, and forgiveness is huge. It's so mm-hmm. huge. If you don't forgive and you hold ben. on, to something, it just stays in there. It's time just Bottled not, up. Mm-hmm. it'll start to fester and it can make your heart hard. So you want to be able to dump the baggage quickly. Don't, re- you know, you, if the stuff, if it still keeps happening over and over again, you have to deal with it, but don't hold on to the grudge. Um, yes. And the lack of spiritual connection is really important too, because I do talk to a lot of Christian couples, but not only I, I work with all people, people of all faiths, but the statistic that I love to give people is that only 5% of people get divorced when they pray together, which is really powerful. And why is that? Because there's a connection that you're making, not just with your spouse, but with God, and you're inviting him into your situation Beautiful, yeah. and he answers, right? So I'll, I'll talk to Christian couples and say, do you guys pray together? And 95% of them don't. And I'm like, okay, we're missing the power. Well, we're going to start. <laughs> yeah. So I, I hope that I encourage them, get yourself a little devotional book, you know, okay. um, and spend, you know, it doesn't have to be long, but make that connection because it is very intimate and very personal to pray with mm-hmm. someone. If you're not used to it, you know, it might and, feel uncomfortable, but it really makes a huge difference because you're not trying to do it in your own strength. You're asking for help. You're asking God to intervene and help you. The infidelity issue is. I apologize a- though. We have to go. We don't have time oh. to discuss the rest of it. That's why I said next time we're going to have to get into the yeah. the rest of it. Okay. And that's going to be a big topic, right? Yes. But, uh, big- Dr. Carla McGowan, uh, Radiant Coaching and Counseling, please reach out to her with any questions. One more time, tell us the website. Yes. RadiantCoachingAndCounseling.com. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And happy new year again. Happy Great year. topics. Great yes, conversation. Yes. And guess what? We're going to finish this next time. So uh, it's going to be good. Stay tuned for part two. Have a fantastic weekend. Okay. Do the same. Thank you. The couple that stays together is the couple that prays together together. is my takeaway today. Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, online radio box, and simple radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on MyTuner-Radio.com, or search Podcast Business News Network on Streama.com and OnlineRadioBox.com slash US. Take your podcast on the go, and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's... It's crucial. 
Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage-free, fully adaptive, handicapped accessible house, and there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit hfotusa.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's going to be okay.